I actually came to Marsha in 1967 as a co-op from Alabama A&M. Um, I really hadn't thought about coming to NASA, but I kind of got bored with college for a semester and decided to go down to the uh, co-op office, and they had this position available at Marsha, and I applied for it and, and got it. Well, the process was you'd go sign up in the co-op office, and then they would uh, show you the position that was available that was in your particular major. So I just went and it happened to be a position open at Marsha. And the reason I liked that position was because I could stay on in, at school in, in the dormitories and, and come out to Marsha every day versus having to move. A lot of folks co-op, they went to different cities, so you had to go find residents and all that stuff so for me. It was a lot easier to accept the Marshall position. Well, when I when I came to A and M in in '64, um, I decided to major in math primarily because of Frank Harley, who had gone to A and M and taught me math in high school. And at that time, in Alabama, if you didn't have eight students taking a course, the state wouldn't pay for uh, for anybody to teach the class. So uh, Frank taught us trigonometry. Uh, after school, we came back after school to teach trigonometry because we didn't have eight people wanting to take it. He taught um, civil tremor in our geometry during one of our breaks and taught us advanced algebra during some study hall. So we was able to, to pick up math uh, from Frank because he, uh, he was just that um, interested in students being able to, uh, to major in math. Uh, when I came to A&M, my algebra class was the same algebra book that I had used in high school. I guess that's the only book Frank had, so he taught us out of that. So, so that one thing, people thought I was really smart, but they didn't know I had already taken the course once before, so that worked out real good. But Howard Foster came to A&M about that same time, and he started the physics program now. So myself and uh, four other students were the first students to minor in physics at Alabama a and So Foster started that program, and you know, eventually they produced a PhD in that, in that program, which was a big tribute to, to Dr. Foster. So he was really pushing math and science, and he also uh, was the one that started uh, uh, helping students get uh, positions out at uh, Redstone and NASA uh, and also he had this agreement with MIT that he could send students there during the summer. So he kind of expanded, you know, the horizon for students to have an opportunity to go to graduate school after A&M. So, so I think it was really uh, the beginning, I would say, of the renaissance of math and science at Alabama A&M. And my first job at Marshall was a uh, computer uh, operator and building uh, 4200 down in the basement. You know, operated a controlled data 1600 computer. Well, I, my, my first day, as I always say, it was kind of exciting and apprehensive at the same time because I had always been in a total black environment. You know, I had, had went to all black high school and A&M was predominantly black. So when I came to NASA, that was my first time being uh, kind of integrated into the uh, majority organization. So I was kind of apprehensive about how that was going to be uh, and kind of excited about coming to NASA and finding out what was going on there. So my first day, I came in, and it was a uh, very nice lady, uh, Doris Roden. I never will forget her. She was over the uh, operation of the computer there and everything. And so I came in, and Larry Caddy, a uh, guy from Auburn, we both came in the same day as co-op, and she said, you boys don't have to be afraid. I can teach you how to operate a computer. <laughs> so, so from now on, <clears throat> she made us feel relaxed, and uh, it really was an easy transition going to learn how to operate a computer. On the, on the first day when I came to the uh, computer lab, especially operating in 4200, I was in 4200, and most of the other folks in the computer lab was in 4663. So there were some blacks that I knew over there, but you know, my first experience, like, I guess most of my first semester, I didn't get have much interaction over there, but there was people like Clyde Foster, Delana Hyder, Richard Hall, and uh, Fletcher that was working in the uh, 
in the computer lab that I knew. So later on, I had a chance to interact with them, and they was able to uh, kind of lead me uh, through the process and uh, things you really needed to do to be successful. Didn't notice it a whole lot, but you know, at that time, I, I think it was, uh, I didn't notice the culture had changed. Uh, you know, women wasn't allowed to wear pants back in that time frame. A lot of people don't remember that. But uh, I think it was like 60, 68, 60 something, when they first said women could wear pants to work. So, so that was a big change. Uh, I did notice that we had more. Uh, blacks coming on co-op at that time because there were several other people from A&M that came on co-ops before, before, after I did. So, so I could sense that there was some changing, but you know, the whole management structure was primarily uh, white. You know, there weren't very many blacks in, in management at that time. So really didn't think much about it. I just knew that I wanted to do the best job that I could and that, you know, I had aspiration from the very beginning. I guess I did a uh, paper when I was in graduate school where they said lay out your career, and I kind of laid out my career, and, and my goal was to be uh, in charge of a major organization within NASA. So I didn't really see, I guess, the direct relationship between, you know, what was happening locally, like downtown in Marshall, but I did see the effort to... Um, to hire more minorities in Marsha during that time period. They, I mean, once the EEO board got up and running, they kind of set goals for centers to do, and they start actually looking at the percentage of minority they had. So that was a, that was a, a big effort to go and, and, and recruit and hire more minorities. And Charlie Smoot was hired in the uh, Human Resources Office back at that time, primarily to uh, recruit blacks to NASA. And a lot of the blacks that came in was a result of Charlie going out recruiting them. Between, I think between Charlie Smoot and Clyde Foster, they probably brought in 90% of the earlier blacks at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Because both of those guys had a real interest in it. I've, I've talked to, to Charlie about that over the years. And what he did, he said, we, we have an opportunity here to get a good job, he talked about Huntsville because he, he, you know, he was from around Huntsville, had been around him for a while. His wife worked at Alabama A&M. So he could sell them on the, you know, the, the um, A&M community, uh, primarily selling them on the opportunity at Marsha to come to be a part of something uh, great early on. So I think that was Charlie's message, you know. We, we have a affluent black community here. You know, Marsha, we're going to give you the opportunity to succeed in a career in, in math and science that you, uh, you know, you went to school for. I know some of his big recruits went down to Southern University where he uh, taught some people there now from coming. I said, after I would start co op and we had a, uh, I think one of my alternate co op was, uh, members was from down at Southern, so. You know, if I thought there was an issue, I wouldn't talk to people. You know, we, I think we talked about before that there was this one guy that people kind of said that he was prejudiced and all this. So I went to his office and sat down and talked to him, and and he said, well, I'm not prejudiced, and I will help you learn as much as I can until I think you're ready to take over my job, and then I'm not telling you anything. Else. One of the things that I always remember, you know, the higher you go in the organization, the more people are looking at you. So you have a bigger responsibility to carry yourself in a certain way. So when I came out here, I think the highest black was a GS-13, and that was Clyde Foster and, and uh, you know, Heidi and those guys over in Comp Labs. So I think that was the, that was the highest, highest grade we had out here. And uh, later on, I think, you know, after the EO office got started, you know, Clyde got promoted to a 14 uh, when he came to the EO office. And, and then eventually, uh, some of the other guys got promoted to a uh, to 14. People like Richard Hall and, and Fletcher and those guys, and Lord Gardner. He was in in, pay, in um, program development, I think. He and uh, Dave McGlackery. So the well, yeah, Clyde was 
you know, he was one of those guys, and, and one of his mantras was Clyde always tried to help other people. So although he was, uh, you know, very smart and very successful himself, he always looked out for trying to help other people. You know, being interested in, uh, in computer science and wanting to give people the opportunity, uh, they gave him a leave of absence from NASA to go work at A&M full time, and he started a computer program. And it turned out that was the first computer science uh, program in the state of Alabama, at Alabama A&M. A lot of people probably don't know that now, but, you know, Clyde, he did all that, and you know, I kind of wonder, you know, you know, how did you, you kind of do that on your own, you know, from just going with the limited resource he had at A&M, but a very successful program. I mean, still a successful program today, and students are able to contribute from his efforts. So one of the things in the comp lab or in programming, you know, you have to have some certain certifications to do certain kind of program. And at that time, most of the training was done downtown in hotels, and you know, blacks weren't allowed in there in the early, early late 50s and, and things. So Clyde worked to get those courses taught at A&M, or he went to IBM or somewhere else to take the courses to get certified. So, so his big push was to make sure the opportunities were available for everybody. And when I first came on full time in August of uh, 68, Kind of pulled me to the side and say, "I know you. I know you're smart. Say if you um, if you keep your nose clean and and do a good job, you can go far in this organization." You know, so I, I kind of wondered what to keep your nose clean was, but eventually I found that that was you know not not get into trouble, do your work, and 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 things would work out for you. So so he was good in that perspective, and you know later on, about seventy three or sometime they started um agency-wide Equal Opportunity Board, and uh, Clyde had was made Deputy uh, EO Officer here at Marshall on the Art Sanderson. So we got a chance to interact a lot then because I was on that board. When they started the board, it was made up of uh, the EO officers from all the centers and all the deputy center directors, and they had four employees on that board, and I was one of those employees. We had a lady from Garlic, black lady, and a white lady from Ames, and then we had an Hispanic gentleman from down at, at uh, Kennedy Space Center. So the four of us was on there, I guess, to kind of give the employees um, a voice, but they didn't realize that we had big voices, so we uh, kind of rocked the boat on a lot of stuff as a part of that committee, and eventually uh, they decided they didn't need us, so that was okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was fighting the war for us. Because <laughs> I dra drafted into the Army right after I uh, came to work for, uh, for NASA. So I was, uh, I was in the Army at that time, and we was all looking at it on TV, and everybody was looking at me because I was at NASA saying, is this going to be successful? So, you know, I was assuring everybody that it was great and it was going to work, and it, and it really did, you know. So, so I, wasn't, I didn't get an opportunity to go seeing at Apollo launches, but you know, from my knowledge here at Marsha and my um, being able to uh, run the programs of the trajectory to the moon from a lot of the folks as a co-op and also start some of the programming after I graduated, I kind of knew the steps and I could say, this is what should happen next, this is what should happen next, so I could go through the sequence of what was supposed to happen. I, my class graduated in May of 1968. And I didn't graduate to August because I had done the two co-op periods, uh, which was very fortunate to only graduate three months later than my class. But before I got home in May, I had the letter to go down for my examination, you know, for physical for the Army. So I came back by the draft board and told them I wasn't graduating to August, so, you know, could they see fit to not draft me before August? And they assured me that they would but they didn't give me much time after that. <laughs> in, in September, I got the letter to say, you got to have to go in October 6th. So, but I went to Fort Benny, did basic training at Fort Benny, and then I got assigned to Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, and I was as a computer operator, so my experience as a computer operator gave me a good MOS in the Army, so I didn't have to go out to infantry and all of those good things. So. So I at Fort Lewis working in the overseas replacement office where we actually process 
people through that was going to Korea and Vietnam, primarily to Vietnam. So we got our list every day of everybody that was coming through. So I'd go down the list to see if there were people on there that I knew. And a lot of my friends came through. Some of the people that I was in basic training came through. So I'd go down and have a drink with them and say, I hope I have one with you when you come back. Fortunately, when we got down to about 17 months or so, in that particular unit, people usually got sent to Vietnam. I got down to about 14 months, and I got assigned to the Pentagon. So people were saying, who do you know? <laughs> so I don't know anybody. <laughs> but they needed computer operators. So that, that computer operation experience really benefited me throughout being in the Army. So I got assigned to the Pentagon and for multiple Multiple services unit, you know, we had Air Force, Navy, and all of those guys in. And we actually worked in the, um, up at Fort Ritchie, where they had the underground Pentagon up there in the, in the mountain there. So, so that was very fortunate. Didn't go to Vietnam, you know, watched a lot of folks go and a lot of them come back. I could see that the uh, time frame for getting promoted to a 14 was too long for my ambition. So that's when I decided to apply for jobs elsewhere. So I applied for a job at headquarters and applied for a job at Kennedy. And within a one week period, I got, I got two job offers at headquarters and a one job office down at Kennedy. So I decided to take the one down at Kennedy because I kind of decided that you could go to headquarters almost any time. So I went to Kennedy as a 14 and uh, had a very good career there. I ended up as uh, Deputy Center Director down at Kennedy and left down with the headquarters as uh, Associate Administrator for Institution and Management, which is now the Mission Support Office up at headquarters. Mm -hmm.